Hello and welcome to the New Times. I am Elisa Jade Natasha and today I have an interesting guest who we are going to have an interesting conversation around systems of education in Africa. I will let him introduce himself, but one thing I know about him is he is an educator as he defined himself. So let's hear what he has to say. Thank you very much Jade for having me. Um, thank you everybody who is watching. My name is Charlene President Komo. I'm the founder of an organization called the Juice League leadership initiative. This is an organization that seeks to bridge the gap between schools and communities. We are trying to shift education from certificates to skills, to shift education from producing job seekers to job creators. We are trying to shift education from just the knowledge of things to also knowing people, which is networking and the power of partnerships. So Duce, you said a couple of interesting words that we'll come back to. You said knowledge, you said networking, that are all interesting tools in education. But well, just to give context to this conversation, I recently had an interesting conversation with um, one of young Africans and he was saying that the problem of Africa was lack of intellect, people who are bold enough to actually drive the change to the Africa that we want. And according to him, Agenda 2063 paints the perfect picture of the Africa we want. And then another friend also said something too, that we really don't have, um, we, the, the problem is not that we don't have intellect, people who are uh, like enough intellect to actually drive the change, that he just needs, that he said that we need people who are not just literate, but are also, n that also have information. And that this information, it should not just be handed to them, but it should also uh, know how to interpret and take it to use. And that this would also actually drive to the change that we all want to see in Africa. And they all come to the same argument that Africa is not suffering as it is portrayed, but that it just needs some um, to overcome some challenges as any other part of uh, the world as well. Right? So now, my point is, what are the systems of education that we have in place already? And are they in favor of what we are trying to achieve? If you are, you will tell me, first of all, if you agree with them that we need intellect, uh, we need literate people that are also informed to actually drive, um, to actually become the Africans that we want, right? And you tell me if it is not already the case and that we, you think what basically we can, um, basically your thoughts around the topic, right? Well, I, I think I think that's a very good question, although it is loaded with a lot of things, and I'll try to touch on some of them. And if I don't touch off all of them, I think we can still have a discussion around them. First of all, we need to understand that the African Union has a vision called the Africa we want. And in that vision, it articulates very important things that they think Africa should be able to achieve by the year 2063. It talks, to, it talks about an integrated continent, it talks about a prosperous continent, it talks about a peaceful continent, it talks about our culture. But one of the things that I love that it talks about is aspiration number six, which talks about um, a people-driven development. Now, when you talk about a people-driven development, you are putting the people at the center of bringing that development that they want, especially the women and the youth. So the question should be, are those people prepared? What has prepared them to deliver that Africa we want? Which is the reason why, in my introduction, I talked about my foundation seeking to bridge the gap between the school and the development that we want. Again, when we talk about then, when you then say intelligent people, or when you talk about literate people, in which context are we talking about that? Because the problem we face is we find certain definitions of intelligence and certain definitions of what an educated person is that are not, number one, African, defined by African, and that are not in line with the Africa we want to develop. Because every time we talk about the African continent, there's something that we need to put into consideration first, that we are a continent that is coming from colonialism, and before the colonization of the Ghan, there was a colonization through education, which was used as a weapon of manipulation, in the sense that education was put in place to make sure that Africans are educated to become good, 
job seekers, not to become entrepreneurs and create the opportunities because the colonizer wanted to be the provider and wanted to be to us to be the workers. Before you move on to say other things, just uh, make it elaborate. According to you, mm -hmm. what is an African intellect person mm -hmm. in the African context mm -hmm. and in the African way, mm -hmm. quoting you? First of all, I think that's, that's again difficult to define, but for me, first of all, I would say it is a person who is educated with an education that seeks to achieve, first of all, the vision that Africa is pushing. So let's, let's say, for example, Africa has a vision 2063. But when we go to the classrooms of Africans, we don't see them educated in line with that which we say is our vision. So we have a vision, we have a dream, but then we are not waking up to achieve it, particularly because the education is not supporting that vision we have. So when I talk about an African, first of all, what is the vision of Africa? And how are we educating our people in line with that vision? That's number one. Number two, I look at an African, African education as because when I look at the word the education, it actually comes from Latin words educere and educare, which means to bring out and to mold. So the second thing I would say is you have to be educated from the place of who you are, not just what you can do. I'm speaking about identity as an African. Mm -hmm. That is why you see a lot of our educated people have no sense of love for the continent, love for themselves, love for what they come from. They use education as a scapegoat to get access to other countries, not to develop the continent, because the education we have offered was just to compete to get certain things outside the continent, not to really be proud of the continent. So when I talk about an educated African, I'm talking about a person who is educated in line with the vision that Africa has. I'm talking about a person who is educated from the place of who we are as Africans. I'm also talking about a person who is educated with an education system that is decolonized. That doesn't leave you in a colonial hangover, just an extension of colonialism in our classroom. We need to decolonize that by making sure that it allows our people to be creative, innovative, but also think deeply about their continent's sense of pride. When one looks at the systems that are currently in our African countries, they would say that we have poor quality content, for example, outdated curriculum that are colonial based, and that we have inadequate materials, that we don't have all the materials that we would actually need to have that quality education, and that we have poor quality processes, for example, untrained teachers, poor school management, and then they also say that we have um, national legal frameworks that are not in line with um, the vision, as you said, and that that, that, is, that can be seen in the lack of compulsory uh, education requirements that build the holistic person that we want to we wanna have. And then there is also the poor legal enf enforcement of education policies. You see, when you look at all those things, you as the educator that you are, and you're, you're literally doing it not in the system that we... we the way you will have to explain a little bit about what you do so that this can give people context to what I'm referring to. But I know that you're not doing, you're trying to bring something that is not currently in our system. And so how are you going to do this in a way that is going to be different and that is going to tackle all those challenges that I just mentioned? First of all, I, I would still say, you know, principles are universal, but their application is contextual. So the first thing that I think Africa should be allowed to do is to define what quality education means in our context. Because we have a problem of certain nations, certain systems that have made their definition of things the universal language of what everything should be. So when we say quality education, when we say we are lacking this or we are lacking that, the first thing is according to whose definition don't we have the quality education? Because to some quality education is speaking good English, and that can be taken as quality education. Or when you look at how African countries are ranked when it comes to education, you realize that it's literacy rate, it's things like attendance in class, and it's things like, but when you look at those things really don't develop the continent. So maybe it's about time as Africans we say, what does quality education mean to us? And then we might find that quality education might mean, and that this is just an example I'm giving, might mean preparing graduates who are able to make use of the vast resources and opportunity that Africa has. 
for the benefit of the African continent. If that is quality education to us, then this, when we say you don't have quality education, it's in line with that which we have defined. So I totally understand that there are a lot of challenges within the existing system, part of it being how it is colonially templated. This is something that colonizers left, and we cannot trust it to deliver um, you know, the country we want post-independence. Second, being access and all these challenges that we have. But more than that, to me, it's really, do, have we been given an opportunity to define our own education? So I cannot even start you know, debating on quality, debating on all these challenges, because they are challenges of a rotten system. I don't want to defend it or to support it, but I'm saying, maybe let's think different. And this is, in short, this is, this is what I could say. For example, when we complain about content, is it really about the content or it's about how we deliver it? For example, students study history in high school and we ask a question like this, um, where is, when did the French Revolution start? We ask questions like, who became a leader after this one and all that? And you just realize those questions don't really help anyone at the end of the day. But maybe, how about we start asking something like, let's say you were a king during that time, how were you going to deal with this issue? So that what you are doing is you are creating problem solvers through a simple history question. So for me, my worry is not really a change of content, but it's a change of approach in how we even approach that content, where we leave students with this content as a way to prepare them for problem solving, for creativity, for innovation, not just something they had to recite after everything, because you cannot create the critical thinkers that way. Well, I don't know if we can come to agree that maybe not everything is flawed. I mean, take a yeah, look at yeah. this, right? Almost all big inventions, whether technological, medical, and basically from anywhere, they come from outside, the, outside the continent, right? So why don't you think that it is rather an opportunity for Africans to learn from others, just not to say the best? Because in this, in this, um, in this case, they're the ones we are actually going to learn from since they have where they are already, right? What do you say about that? Who are the ones that you're talking about? I mean, outside the continent, I won't, I won't specify to say the West, I won't specify to say Europeans. No, I would just say outside the continent. All the big inventions, technological, medical, let's even not go far, the COVID-19 vaccine. It came from outside the continent. Yeah. So how about maybe it's an opportunity for, for us to learn from others? There's nothing wrong about learning from others. It's a good thing, actually. Even companies learn from others, people learn from other people. What we know today, we've learned it from other people. But there is everything wrong to start learning from others without knowing where you stand. Because even what you're going to learn, is just going to be useless. That's why you see the problem has never been learning, but what you do with what you learn. And if you look at what you do with what you learn, is not a result of where you have been learning. It's a result of who you are. That's why you see some of us have gone to school and what we started thinking was the next country we can go to, the, the, the expensive cars we can buy, but there are those who have gone to school and really came back to the continent to further develop the continent because of who they are and what they believe the continent has to be. So I'm not arguing that we need monopoly of things, we need to close the continent and never learn from others, there is everything wrong, but I'm saying let us make sure that we make Africans understand where they come from, understand who they are, understand where they are going, empowered enough that even when they learn, they are able to disseminate what is right for us and what is not right for us. Because even now, do we even know what is right for us? And do we even know what is not right for us? We don't because we have not clearly outstated what is our vision post-independence. And we, if we are capable of doing that, then we can judge what is right and what is wrong based on that. And then if we build our people with an education system that allows them to know who they are, then they know their place in the continent. So if we are to go to other countries to learn and all that, how are we going to use that education that we are learning to develop this continent? And that remains a question. And if you would agree, you would, you would agree with me that most of the people 
who have, who, have, who have studied in the continent, they've just studied and they got the best grades and they got the best school and that's the end of it. So is education all about competition or it's about fulfilling a mission? Is education all about, about better than being better than everybody in your class and then access what others cannot access? Or it's about really changing the communities we come from? So there's nothing wrong about learning from other people, but there is everything wrong if we learn without an understanding of where we stand because we'll end up photoshopping everything and realizing that it doesn't work for this continent. Well, you keep saying, do we really know what's right for us and what's not right for us? Let, let's look at an example of an African country, right? So Seychelles, you know Seychelles, right? Seychelles is the only country that has reached education for all in Africa. So for Seychelles, they, they defined what's right for them as making education available to everyone, regardless of their background, regardless of their disabilities, basically education for all, right? So um, it is, uh, uh, Seychelles is the only African country um, in the top 15 rated education systems globally. And it owes this, according to UNESCO, the, to the fact that the government spend 11.1, around over 11% of its total budget on education. Basically, they prioritize education through investing more in education. Yeah. And that, so, do, do it is also seen as um, so another thing that makes it possible in the country is that students that are um, students um, between the age of starting school and 16 um, they have free and compulsory education which facilitates the education for all and that it continues till they are 18 right and then from there you can take your own education um, up so what do you say makes um, do you agree that this could also work do you think this could work for the rest of the African countries or the context may differ? And do you think this could be maybe a model to look at? Again, uh, first thing, I really, I really want to appreciate the people of Seychelles for what they have done in terms of giving access to education because we cannot start talking about quality education before even we look at the quantity of people who have made it to school. I think quality is the second thing to talk about after looking at access. And I think it's good to have people access schools, to have people go to school, free programs into education and all this. I think this is good and it's amazing. I'm not that much well versed with their education system, so I'm not going to comment much on that one. But I'm going to say maybe this issue of accessibility, it's something that I really commend. And then to talk of the model, which I think Africa needs or other African countries can maybe take into consideration, I think I'll provide what I think is the model. I will not say Photoshop that of Seychelles and then it will become a model maybe for Rwanda or maybe for Zimbabwe because you might, you might notice that things to do with free education, for example, you might notice that some countries don't have the income capacity to do that. And it can't work in all countries. Things to do with, you know, people just going to school and all that. You might, other countries are not well resourced to achieve that. And that's some of the things we need to maybe talk about. But what I think really for me is the model for uh, that other African countries can put into consideration. It's something that I'm going to suggest, which I think is ideal. First of all, I think number one, we need a curriculum that is developed through, you know, what I would like to say consensus building. Because we are having a curriculum that is developed in a way that schools look like they're an island to themselves. They don't exist in the community we are in. So parents, are they participating in the formation of the models we have? Those that are in the business sector, are they clear about the kind of skills that they need from the graduates that are leaving school? And are their views taken as we put a curriculum? Governments, because you also know that education is a weapon um, towards the fulfillment of government policies. For example, Rwanda has a vision 2050, I think. The schools have a role to play in the in achievement of that vision. Government has a role to play in how people are going to learn. So governments, the business, our parents, our religious uh, you know, centers, our, the community we come from. So do we have a curriculum formulated 
out of a consultation from all those people. Or most of the times what we see in Africa is a curriculum called new, but it's newness, it's just that it is coming in a certain year, but it's not newness in terms of the approach that was used to set it up. Or when they call it new, sometimes it's just because of the content and new topics that were not there that are now part of the curriculum or its approach. So that's number one, consensus building when we set the curriculums. Number two, we really need to move from you know, major-driven kind of studies to really mission-centered or problem-solving curriculums. Because what we have done so far is when a student goes to study, let's say, economics, or let's say, study law, and all study these things, what we have done is we have taken our students as empty buckets that needs to be filled, not as fires that needs to be ignited. Whereby, you go to school to learn everything because you don't know. The history teacher comes, he thinks you don't know Hitler, Mussolini, Mary Antoinette, and all these things, he loads you. The science teacher comes, he teaches you Einstein and all those things you don't know. The accounting teacher comes, he teaches you trading profit and loss and all these things you don't know. You are just being loaded with things. Have they given you time to unleash the potential that is loaded in you? They have not. Even the kind of questions you answer, there are those questions that you have to agree with a certain uh, 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 marking scheme that has been set. Your failure to agree, you become a damn dumb. So, the point I'm making here is, how can we as Africans stop this aspect of viewing our students, our young population? Because the African Union agenda is talking about a people-centered development. You cannot come up with a people-centered development by just filling people with knowledge every day, but you can come up with that by igniting the fires. A school where you go, Jade, and we say, what is your mission? And the school helps you to achieve it, and that becomes a solution to your nation. A school where you say, which problem do you want to solve? And maybe you say gender, issues to do with gender equality. Maybe you say governance, maybe you say corruption, maybe you say economics, all this. And then the school says, how can we support you to achieve that? That way, we are turning our universities, our high schools into centers of innovation, into centers of solutions, into centers of creators of opportunities, not into centers of people that are just looking for jobs. And the, 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 the last thing I would say is, there is also something that I would like to call the Dead Sea. In one of the books I'm writing, I called it the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the distance between schools and the communities. You see, our schools have become small centers that are somewhere in the sea, away from the community. To the extent that they give you a certificate, the community wants a skill. They give you um, a job-seeking mindset when they tell you when you graduate you're going to get a job. When you come to your country, you realize there's a highest level of unemployment. The jobs are not available. Most of the guys who have gotten degrees are just walking in the street. Some of them are now into drugs because they were disappointed by the system. They teach you things, but who you know is more important than what you actually know. There's no time for networking and all that. How do we bridge this gap? It is by making sure that the community is in touch with the school. The school is in touch with the community because schools produce people who change the community, but communities also define how we learn. So something like that, I would think it's a better model for the continent. It's not even everything, but it's maybe what I can suggest, not just the access and so forth. You just compiled different big subjects in few words and we're going to leave our audience to meditate on that and um, well, one thing about, um, one thing that African uh, youth are judged for is that we complain and we have a lot of words but we don't put in action. So Duce, you as the educator that you are, please uh, tell us about what you're doing for the um, for your country, Zimbabwe, and tell us about what you're doing for the, for the continent as a whole. And this is an opportunity for you to also share about your book and basically what are you doing and what would you want to see the youth doing? Thank you very much for that. You know, we, we are a generation that, you know, knows everything wrong except ourselves. One thing I would say is I, in 2017, I graduated from high school in Zimbabwe where I was studying history, divinity, shown and geography. And I, I had like all the A's. I was one of the national top performing students. But I took a gap year to really, because I felt like everything I've been learning from primary where it took me seven years to high school where it took me six years. I felt like I was introduced to everything except myself. I felt so empty, although I was called educated. It's only now that I believe I was schooled, but I was not educated because education is unleashing the inner abilities of a person. It is not loading the person with knowledge. So during that gap year, 
I found it difficult, for example, to get jobs. I found it difficult, for example, to know who to go to, to achieve what. I found it difficult. It's like school had cheated me, you know, because I was the best student in class and I believed I was the best. That was a moment of suffering. That was a moment of depression. That was a moment of being disappointed. That was a moment of losing it. But I shifted that moment because, you know, entrepreneurship is the ability to turn problems, those that affect you and affect others into opportunities. And that's when I launched the foundation Juice Leadership Initiative. Now, Juice Leadership was launched with really saying, let us be able to bridge the gap between schools and communities. So what we have done in Zimbabwe is that we have opened clubs in all the high schools and universities of the Juice Leadership Initiative. Because as young people, we do not have power to change the curriculum. We cannot do it. But at least we have power to add to that the curriculum is doing, either through clubs and you know um, societies. So we put up Juice Leadership clubs in schools and universities. What are these clubs doing? We are focusing on saying certificate is not enough. It is like an icing on a cake. You don't eat it unless you want to get sick. You have to mix it with the bread. What is the bread? It's the skill. So we are saying, how can we be able to develop these young people, to make sure that they gain the necessary skills before they go out? Number two, we are having conversations about how can we shift them from job seekers into job creators. And I'm very happy that Zimbabwe recently introduced the new curriculum, which is Education 5.0, which focuses on skill development and creating job uh, creators. So it adds to what we are already doing in the schools and in, in high schools and in the universities. So we do these um, seminars across the country. We have clubs everywhere. So Juice Leadership now has like 5,000 to 10,000 young people as an organization. Apart from that, Juice Leadership Initiative has an organization called Think Tank 35. So under Think Tank 35 is we want to connect 35 mentors with 35 um, a, a, a mentees to produce 35 opportunities every year. So this is also our way of saying, how can we make sure that these young people that are in schools, they meet experts, mentors that are already working, so that their mind can be transformed and they can get the necessary help to develop their problems into solutions and their solutions into businesses and their businesses into you know, creating employment and so forth. So I ran that foundation. Apart from that, I also speak a lot about education. So, so here in Rwanda, we just opened something called Live Zone, where we really just talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about leadership and the 21st century skills, with really the idea of saying, even those that are in Zimbabwe, can they also learn from the good things that the youth here are actually doing? Because I went to LU, studied there for the past four years, and I've met some of the most amazing entrepreneurs across the continent. So there's always a need for us to keep on learning from each other, even our own, not just saying another person should come. So with LiveZone, we're still doing the same, bridging the gap between schools and communities. Another thing I've done is to start speaking about these things. You know, unlike old days where you needed to queue on Rwanda TV or on ZBC or on SABC, you can simply open your Facebook page, your YouTube, your YouTube account, and start talking about things that matter. These are some of the things young people are privileged with and young people can do. Apart from that, I write as well. Articles, um, but I'm working on a book. So the book is called The Uneducated Graduates. So it is going to be a book that has three books, right, different volumes. I don't know why I'm sharing this. I was not supposed to share. <laughs> it's going to have, so the first volume is going to be called Colonial Hangover, where I want to talk about how the education systems we have are colonially templated and they've left a lot of Africans still colonized. And unless the rotten tooth is removed from the mouth, the mouth must chew with caution. So colonialism is still in our classrooms. How can we remove it? The second one is called Dead Sea. Dead Sea is where I want to explain the distance between the schools and communities and how most of our graduates become misfits in the market. And then the last one is going to say, it's going to be called the teacher that schools of education failed to produce. This is where I want to really explain teaching, not as an opportunity to harm students with content, but teaching as an opportunity to partner with God to discover, develop and unleash that which he has created. Teaching as an opportunity not to see a student as a bucket that needs to be filled, but to see a student as a potential to the family, to the country, and to the world, and work with the student to develop that. Not to see teaching as an opportunity to instruct, but as an opportunity to help the student unleash what they have. Well, 
um, that's the kind of young people we need <laughs> in this continent. <laughs> Seriously, I know you're not you're not very old yeah, in sure. age. So seeing that you can actually um, have this conversation and plan on how to contribute to your own country and come to the country that hosted you for the past of uh, uh, four years, uh, I mean Rwanda, and then you're thinking of broadening the idea to the whole continent. That's truly commendable, and we can only call the rest of young people who also think that they can um, contribute to different sectors that would develop the Africa that we want to do what they have got to do, right? For Duce, it's education. For me, it's information. What about you? Thank you.